Traveling here, my name's Pete Walker. Um, I'm with a company, Vanessa Hang in Bruslin, out of Bedford, New Hampshire. I've been working on this project with Paul Vlasic, the town engineer, for the last few years. And I know uh, most, many of the people in the audience tonight who have attended uh, previous meetings. Um, there's a few other people that I wanted to point out um, that are attending tonight. Rita Walsh, who's an architectural historian, um, cultural resources specialist, who will be doing part of the presentation with me. Um, we're here tonight to talk specifically about historical impacts and the Section 106 process. And Dave Cadell, who's a project manager with the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, is attending tonight and ultimately has responsibility to make sure um, this consultation goes uh, smoothly. Um, we have some representatives from um, the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources, Nadine Peterson and Edna Feitner. I already mentioned Paul Vlasic, the town engineer, who's managing the project for the town. And then we have Bill Jordan, who's chair of the Great Dam Remembrance Committee. So um, what we wanted to do uh, this evening is we are, there's a lot of familiar faces uh, in the audience, but there's also some new faces. And this presentation will be uh, broadcast on Channel 22. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time providing some very um, um, uh, very uh, preliminary uh, project history and background for folks who may not be as familiar and may not have been uh, attending all the meetings over the years, um, just so everybody understands where we're at in the process. Again, the focus tonight is on Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, so we'll, Rita will discuss what that process is and where we're at with it. She'll talk about uh, some of the studies that have been conducted over the years, including some things that have uh, uh, been uh, resolved and, and finalized in the, over the last few months. We'll talk about next steps for the Section uh, 106 uh, consultation. And then Bill Jordan is going to speak about his uh, town committee, the Great Dam Remembrance Committee. So in terms of uh, some project background, um, the Great Dam in the center of the community is classified is, and regulated as a Class A dam by the state of New Hampshire. There's a set, set of regulations that spell out what that dam, how it needs to perform, how uh, regulations in terms of maintaining the dam. Um, and over the years, going back as far as 2000, DES observed that uh, the Great Dam was not uh, fully meeting all of the state regulations for uh, dam safety and specifically under higher flows I think if you've been in town you've seen what happens under the higher flows in the Exeter River where the dam is overtopped and that is an inherently unsafe condition so since uh, uh, 2000 uh, the town has been working the dam bureau has been encouraging um, requiring the town of Exeter to do something about the dam to bring it up to the current um, uh, safety regulations. And over the years, um, there's been a number of studies by a number of consultants um, that looked at what the options would be for uh, how, how, to, how to fix a dam. Um, at the beginning of the discussion, it was really looking at modifying uh, the dam um, to make it, make it a safe dam, but leave it in place. And then uh, over the years, the idea of removing the dam um, uh, came uh, came to be sort of the, the selected alternative, if you will. Um, VHB, we, we performed and published a, a feasib what, what I call the feasibility study in October of 2013 that was, that was published. And that feasibility study looked at um, all of the feasible options, uh, reasonable options for dealing with the dam uh, safety issue. Uh, including a dam removal. And then um, about, I guess about a year ago, almost a little less than a year ago, um, the w town warrant article eight, which allocated the money to actually remove the dam was passed by the town. So for the last several months, we've been engaged in the process of actually going through the engineering design and permitting process for, um, for actually removing uh, the dam. Uh, the work that we've done has been overseen by the Exeter River Study Committee and, and, and Lionel, I, Lionel Ingram, I forgot to introduce you as chair of the, uh, 
<laughs> uh, Lionel is uh, attending this evening, um, as are uh, several other members of, of the Exeter River Study Committee. Um, there's also a, 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 a subgroup that what we call the working group that was formed that really um, uh, followed the feasibility study um, very, very closely. So the folks whose names are underlined on, from the main study committee were also on the working group. And then the working group brought in um, several uh, folks from uh, New Hampshire DES and NOAA and others from the town. Uh, to to uh, serve on that working group. Uh, here's an aerial photograph of the dam site itself. Um, just to orient you, uh, we're basically looking mostly in a southerly direction. So we have the string bridge here, the what we call the great bridge or the high street bridge here, uh, the library, Founders Park. This is Water Street. The green bean is, I think, this building right here. I think this is the Chocolatier, 11 Water Street, Loaf and Ladle. And the dam itself spans the river here. Um, you may hear us referring to the headworks, which is this structure on the uh, eastern side of the river. And then you can see uh, the fish ladder and this lower dam, which was installed, which we call the fish weir. And essentially, the proposed um, project is to remove uh, remove all of these elements that I've just highlighted. We are still in the process of designing exactly what the project is going to be. The engineers are working on it. We have some draft plans. But as of today, we are discussing removing the main spillway of the Great Dam, all of the fish ladder, all of the lower fish weir, and then the headworks as well. And then there'd be some work that would, um, there's some, some walls along uh, the river on the, on the west side, specifically on the west side, um, and we'd be doing some work, not directly to the walls, but um, filling in front of those walls with some earth and some, some stone to uh, ensure that those, those uh, walls are stable after the dam is removed. So that is essentially the proposal that's on the table. This is a um, visualization that was done, I know, uh, many of you have seen this before. This was published in the feasibility study in, in 2013, and it's a it's a it's a general um, a general view of what the river would look like um, shortly after uh, dam removal. So this these black lines are uh, this this frame represents the, where the dam is actually located in the image. This is the fish ladder. Um, this is the new wall behind um, the uh, chocolatier. And, um, and this is obviously showing the impoundment drawn, drawn down. So that is just a brief background of, of the project itself. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Rita Walsh. Again, I'm Rita Walsh, Senior Preservation Planner with VHB. Uh, I work with Pete a lot, although I'm in a Massachusetts office of the company. And I'm going to start with a very brief explanation of Section 106. It, it is uh, a very important federal law that's part of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And that first sentence, or the second sentence, Section 106, which is part of that law, requires federal agencies to take into account the effect of their projects on historic properties. They are also supposed, they are supposed to uh, allow the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, that's a federal agency also, the, um, to comment on projects. This is a consultation review process. This is not an approval process. The federal agencies are in charge of this process. They do have to take comments and work with other consulting parties that I'll, I'll talk about with the State Historic Preservation Office, which is the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources. Um, and it has several steps to it that I'll go through. Um, as Pete said, the Army Corps of Engineers is the lead federal agency. And we say lead federal agency because many times there are more than one federal agency involved in a project. One of them has to lead this process. One person has to be in charge. Uh, NOAA was the lead federal agency back, you know, two or three years ago when we were starting this project. 
and that's when we started the Section 106 process. Um, as I said, the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources is always involved in this process, and consulting parties are also involved in this process, and we have seven consulting parties besides the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources involved, and you can see those names. Um, so, again, you don't want to read this. I don't want to go into a lot about this, but it is what we call a four-step process. You don't always have to go through all of these steps. It depends on, first of all, is there a project, and we call them an undertaking, that has the potential to affect historic properties. And historic properties are buildings, it's archaeological sites, it's the, the term we use. Um, so if it's the type that could affect a historic property, then you go on to identifying what those historic properties are. And that's a lot of what we've been doing over the last few years. Um, and if historic properties are identified and it's determined that they're affected, then we assess what we call the effects and if they are adverse, and that's another part of the, the language of this law, um, then we try to resolve those adverse effects by seeing if the project itself can be mitigated, minimized, avoided. If not, then um, there is an agreement that there is an adverse effect and mitigation measures are then agreed upon. So that, in a nutshell, is but again, along the way, you can stop the process. If there are no historic properties within the area where the project is happening, you're done with the process. Um, if no historic properties are adversely affected, so sometimes there are federal projects that actually you know, are good. They rehab buildings, they save things. Um, but if it's an adverse effect, then we go on to that fourth step. So, over the last, what is it now, three years, we've been involved in um, four major studies or reports that we have completed. Um, the, I would say the earliest one we started was the project area form. This is a, a planning document um, that we use in New Hampshire. It's a form from the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources that lays out what is in the area or around the area where the project is going to happen. We talk about if there's been previous identification efforts, surveys, what we call designation efforts, you know, properties listed in the National Register or local historic districts, which abound in downtown Exeter. Um, and I do have a map that um, shows all of this visually at the back of the room. Um, we talk about the history of the development of the um, community, where the project is happening. Um, and then we, because the dam, we knew the dam was either going to be modified or removed at the time, and this was three years ago, we were required to also do a separate inventory form on the dam itself to document when it was built, how it was modified, um, and its contribution to the history of the town. Um, it had not really be, been mentioned in the uh, district nomination. The Exeter Waterfront Commercial Historic District is right in the area where this project is proposed to happen. Hadn't really been mentioned, so uh, it was required that we prepare some more documentation on that. Um, and then, of course, because we're right next to a river in an old part of town, you know, the potential for archaeological uh, resources was uh, definitely something we needed to look at. And the first thing was what's called a phase 1A. This is what we also call a literature search, where we look to see, you know, what do we already know about known sites? Um, an archaeologist, and I am not an archaeologist, this was done by someone else, you know, walks around the area to determine if, you know, they can see if there's been disturbance, um, if there's open area that hasn't been disturbed yet. Um, and provides recommendations if we need to go on to the next phase of investigation, which we call a phase 1B. And a phase 1B is where you actually do the test pits that you know, archaeologists you know, are known for. So those were the four studies. Oops. I'm going to talk very briefly about the archaeological survey because, as I just said, I am not an archaeologist. Um, so the survey that was done in, or the report that was done in, I believe it was 2012, did recommend that um, there be some phase 1B investigation. Um, 
because the, uh, the thought was there would be some what are called archaeologically sensitive areas. The Division of Historical Resources concurred with that recommendation that they go forward um, with the Phase 1B. The Phase 1B, um, the Phase 1A report was done by VHB. The Phase 1B was done by uh, independent archaeological consultants out of Portsmouth. Um, and they tested both sides of the river. And what they found was uh, that there had been quite a lot of fill on both sides of the river over time. They did find artifacts, actually some very old artifacts, but they were not in what they would term the context. There had just, it had all been moved around. So it was determined that they recommended no, ar no further archeological investigation. The New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources agreed with that. So then what I call the above ground historic properties, um, the individual inventory form for the dam uh, included the dam and its components, including the fish passage structure, which is much later. The dam is from, and of course I'm gonna forget because I always do, 1914, I believe. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and the fish passage is from 1969. Uh, the dam was recommended eligible as what we call a contributing resource to the district. It does not, uh, it cannot be individually eligible, but it does certainly contribute to the history of this district. Um, but the fish passage structure was not considered part of that. And again, Division of Historical Resources agreed with that recommendation. The project area form, again, this is a document that uh, is much more extensive, um, you know, goes into the history, the architecture of the area, and provides recommendations on you know, like the phase 1A report for archeology, span do we need to look for any more uh, above ground properties to be identified and evaluated? Uh, because there has been so much uh, already that's been designated um, and because the impacts did not appear to go too far out of the dam removal area, we recommended no new properties be investigated. We did talk about a few to the south uh, Gilman Park, um, the Franklin South River Streets Historic District. It's not, that district was identified just a few years ago. It's on the west side of the river, just south of the downtown. And again, here's the map that's also um, on the board if you want to see that more clearly. But you can, and it's, it's like a puzzle pieces, interlocking districts. Their boundaries all meet one another. And then I'm going to let Pete take over again on upcoming steps in the Section 106 review process. Before I talk about 106, I want to talk about the project overall, which I've alluded to briefly. But um, we have been working um, since uh, since late fall of 2014 doing um, additional surveys, uh, collecting additional information that's required for us to do the engineering design. And those final design surveys are essentially completed. Um, the engineering design I mentioned, we've, we've started again late fall. That's gonna continue on. We're in progress with it. It'll continue on for several more months. Um, we are approaching, we uh, are possibly submitting a, a, an actual permit application as soon as, initially we were saying February, I think it may go in, in March. Um, um, this section 106 consultation um, fits into the picture. We have uh, had meetings, held meetings, submitted information. We had a, a preliminary meeting in, in November with DHR and the consulting parties. Um, and we're expecting the Section 106 consultation to continue through uh, mid midsummer uh, time frame. And overall, what, what we're really targeting is a September 2015 start for our contractor. Um, there would be a bid phase, so the engineering design and permitting would be completed sometime late uh, late summer, uh, early uh, fall, and then we'd have a contractor working on the project to actually physically remove the dam beginning in September of 2015. So this is the current schedule and we're holding to it pretty pretty well. So um, we're very optimistic that it is, it was an ambitious schedule for, sh for sure. There were some folks who were saying it's never gonna come out in September 2015. 
Um, we felt that it was very possible if things go smoothly with the design and, and this consultation process and the permitting process. And we seem to be, we seem to be moving along um, uh, quite, quite well in the process. Um, specific to section 106, uh, there's uh, a few um, uh, milestones that I wanted to, to highlight. Um, I mentioned we had had a coordination meeting in, on November 18th that included uh, DHR uh, and the consulting parties uh, where we had a, a, a meeting which was advertised publicly and we did have members of the public attending that where we spoke about the overall process of what we needed to get done um, before the dam was to be removed. Um, this public informational meeting uh, has been on the schedule for a while. We are planning a second public informational meeting. Um, the, the content would be a little bit different. We talk more about mitigation, less about the process and the impacts, and more about what we're going to do to remember the, the, the dam or, or memorialize the dam. And we are, we're currently looking for that sep second public informational meeting is likely to happen sometime in May or June. Before that, we plan to have two more coordination meetings with DHR, the Corps of Engineers, and the consulting parties. We're looking sometime in March, maybe early April, for a meeting that, where we would be discussing the effects um, and mitigation. And then sometime in April, May, we'd have a draft memorandum of agreement. But um, I might have jumped the gun because you guys may be wondering what effects in the memorandum of agreement really are all about. So there's two main steps left in this process now that we've identified all the historic resources. What we need to do is we really need to describe in some level of detail what the actual effects are. And that is a task that Dave Cadell is, is working on, understanding what the proposed action is, what the permit request is going to be. Um, currently, with the dam being removed, it, uh, you know, Dave, I think, concurs with, with work that had occurred previously that suggested that the, the removal is going to be an adverse effect to, uh, to the uh, Exeter River, uh, uh, the Exeter Waterfront uh, Historic District. So it seems likely that the Corps will um, issue a finding relatively soon in the next month or so that, that formally determines that there be a, a, an adverse effect. Then what we really need to do is there will be a memorandum of agreement that documents that there is an adverse effect and it would spell out the actions that um, the core and the town would be agreeing to um, to to offset um, the uh, offset that adverse effect so that's when we talk in terms of mitigation or remembering remembering the dam um, and and again back to the schedule we're really looking to have a draft of that document out sometime in an April, May time frame, we'd go to a public informational meeting and then at some point after we hear from the public, that memorandum of agreement would be finalized and signed. Again, on this schedule, we're hoping for, for June, uh, early summer would be the appropriate time frame. So, yes. Who is the final time to sign the follow up the town? Is it the town or is it the consultant parties? I'm going to let David Cadell handle that. It would be the town, the DHR, and the Corps of Engineers. So by the town, it would be the, the applicant, the governing, the governing body? Um, speaking of the town, um, the town has formed uh, a committee that is their specific task is to look at um, uh, mitigation or remembering or memorializing the dam. And Bill Jordan is chair of that committee, so I'm going to turn it over to you for a moment. That's us, and uh, we're trying to get input. Our job is to get input from the community about how to remember the dam. And so uh, tonight we're hoping that if anybody has some ideas, they can give them to us. And if, they, if you think of something at 2 in the morning that you couldn't think of now, you can send us an email. Uh, I don't know how to use the pointer, but there's the email address right there. We set up our own Google uh, email address. So. Um, and then we're going to have another meeting on March 24th here at 6.30, same time, same date, same day of the week, so it should be easy to remember. And, um, and that's when uh, that we'll do this again and just try to get, again, some input from as many people as we can. And we'll try to um, do publicity for it. So.
so people come.